Sounds good. Thank you and welcome to the Hive Buddy Online Bee Club meetup for the month of May. Great to have you here, Carmel. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Keeping warm. Lit my first fire of winter a couple of days ago. So, and I've figured out how to keep it going. So that's pretty good. Oh, yeah. that's the go. And talking to some of our people before now, we're all sort of getting to the point where most of us have our beehives all packed away, and um, that's sort of consistent with the turning of the fire, turning on of the fireplace, and the yeah. um, the the gloomy sort of weather that we're facing. But yeah. uh, that's sort of how it works. Um, a quick. Now that's the thing. Well, a quick run through for those that haven't been part of Bee Club before, and I can see that a lot of familiar faces have joined us. So thank you for coming back. And thank you for those that are new and fresh to us here. So we like to run through uh, a lot of what's been going on in the beekeeping uh, space in the last month or so. Some things that you may be aware of, some things that might be a little bit out of the blue. They're the fun ones, I must say. We end up talking, yeah, so we, we like to just, uh, Talk about a little bit about the news and other factors that are uh, that have occurred. Carmel's great at giving us sort of a bit of an update on what's been happening in her apiary and with her bees and with her clients' bees. Sometimes she shares a little bit about that, so that sort of helps us all see sort of where where she's up to. Um, and we'll finish with a few things where I've also dug a little bit deeper and gone to find some find some. Um, sometimes it's some research. Sometimes it's a bit something that's a bit strange or a bit odd but we'll just have a journey over the next hour or so and have a bit of a conversation. Um, and it's great to have you all here as part of it. Now, Carmel, yeah. last time we caught up, just for those that might remember, because some of these some of these topics tend to, tend to tend to loop back. For those that weren't there, we, we had a bit of a conversation about honeybees struggling to get enough good, good gut bacteria. Yeah. And I remember we talked a bit about how it's interesting that the whole honeybee gut side of things and that bacteria and that microbiome is just as important to bees as it is to humans. And I mean, it shouldn't probably surprise anyone, but it was just uh, new to a few of us. But I remember also sharing um, some, some research about um, a more natural location for your bees improves their microbial health. And I remember the uh, general idea of that one, just to recap it for, for, for those that weren't there perhaps, is lots of different diversity, lots of just being in the weather, being in the conditions where you are normally gives them more variety of forage, more variety of conditions, more suitability to your location. And it was talking about how, yeah, we really look at um, a natural location for bees as opposed to in a built environment or yeah. in a homogenous environment, like across a farming area. And you will never forget, and if you have, too bad it's coming back. <laughs> We talked about we talked about how honeybees use animal poo to repel giant hornets, and yeah. if anyone missed that, uh, it's going to be my pleasure to share that link with you later anyway. Because if you weren't part of that meetup and you want to learn a bit more, it's it's pretty funny. Yeah. So that was a little bit about last time. It was and, very funny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the circus as usual. Yeah. Bef um, we're about to go on to a little bit of the news, but before we do, I just wanted to share really quickly for those people that are new to Hive Buddy. Uh, Hive Buddy is our online community to support beekeepers. A lot of you that are here are clearly people that are, know us and are aware of us, and we're a, sort of a place to come together for beekeepers without the fear of judgment and the frustration that can sometimes come around social media groups and other things. So we're an open learning space for all beekeepers. We do a few things. We have this bee club. We also have mentorships that people can join and be part of, small group mentorships. Um, but it's just a place to come together and learn together. But now it's time for us to check up, Carmel, mm. on a little bit of the news that's been happening. Bop, bop, bop. We need some like news music. Dun, 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 Funny you say, so, yeah, we probably do. We need to hit the button. <laughs> and play some, but I'm not sure we'll ever get that technologically advanced. <laughs> Think about how we started this, trying to just make sure our cameras are working properly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Let's yeah. not complicate the matters any. All further. right, what's in the news? Let me hit you here. So, just a few quick ones to go with first. I'm literally reading off a sheet of paper in front of me. So, ABC News reported just uh, a week ago about the Australian Manuka honey producers successfully blocking the New Zealand trademark attempt. 
Now, yes. I don't know if people are aware of that, but it's been been going on for a while. And I've visited New Zealand a few times and beekeepers over there, um, frustrated, livid, other, other words <laughs> about Australian beekeepers. How dare we use the name Manuka in our marketing campaign and in selling our products? Well, their, their legal campaign has finally pretty much fallen over completely. And um, between the US, the European Union, the UK and Australia, um, they didn't win their, their case against, against Australia using the, the uh, trademark Manuka. Great for our industry because our industry gets to um, go off the back of perhaps New Zealand's really good work in the early days yeah. of marketing that really well. And now we get to um, sell that. So I know that, that and sell that using that name. So I know that for a lot of the small scale hobbyists, we probably don't worry about like thinking about having Manuka. But for a lot of the big commercial beekeepers, that's part of their strategy to look for those high value honeys. Mm. So that's a, that's one little bit of news. Whilst on the the, the uh, topic of I manuka caramel, yeah, mm. well, especially the manuka. Yeah. Um, I need to ask you: Have you been down to Coles lately? I do regularly shop shop at Coles. Yeah, there's one mm. across the road from where I live. Anything you need to tell us about um, theft from the supermarket, the the uh, multinational supermarket chain, Carmel? Me. For you. <laughs> No, I, I don't. I don't do any thieving from Coles. Well, it's just as well, but <laughs> someone obviously is. From Coles? Well, someone obviously is. So I've, I've come across another article this week, and yeah. I'm sure some others have come have, have noticed this as well. The headline is Coles keeps Manuka honey under lock and key oh in God. surprise anti theft move. <laughs> <laughs> what okay. have we got? Where have we got to? Um, it's quite priceless. In this article, there is literally a pl clear plastic box, like quite a large box, with a 340 gram Manuka honey bottle uh, inside this box. And I don't know what's more ridiculous is the whole idea that it's sitting there in a safe, yeah. or um, that you've, or that there's like it's on special. And it's yeah. still twenty six dollars for a little container of honey. Yeah, actually, someone's asking, "What was it? Good manuka? Do you know what MGO it is?" Um, it is. It is a. It is a well known brand in Australia. I'll leave it simply as that. Right. Um, <laughs> don't want to go down that debate. I wonder what the MGO is. Probably be um, only a hundred or something. Silly. Oh, I don't even think it's close to that. But um, <laughs> here, it, the other thing that's like the ultimate bit of humour is. Not that it's in a plastic thing, not that it's on special and it's still $26, but apparently it was $30, 10% off, it gives you $26. If you do that maths, that's not how that's not how percentages work. So the whole thing's a debacle. I wonder if people are just trying to stitch us up and if it was April the 1st, it would have fitted in really well, is my <laughs> thinking. <laughs> that's funny. You know what, Propolis is so much better than Manuka as far. But I mean, look, Manuka does help with sore throats, don't get me wrong. But propolis is amazing if you want something for your immune system. Hey, I'm not going to. Everyone I'm just, knows about manuka now. Everyone seems everyone to be. Knows. Yeah. Seems to be. Um, note for this is our, my personal note for you. Whilst everyone's listening, I want to talk to you more one day about propolis in cooking. Let's talk about that one day. Ooh. Not for not for tonight. But yeah, I've got I'm, some more news I'm, now. I'm notes. <laughs> we know we know that we so often have brought up um, the current varroa situation uh, in New South Wales. I'm not going to go deep into that path tonight. Uh, everyone should be looking at the Arbic website for their updates, and most of you here would already probably be associated with your local state yeah. um, apiary body. You're probably well linked in there, but if you're not, you need to go to the Arbic website and have a look. But one thing that's come out of an, uh, an ABC News article, which um, was just earlier this month, the title here is News, Newcastle Council Plan aims to create a pollinator paradise for native bees near the site of the first varroa mite outbreak. Now, their ultimate aim here, well, the, the council voted unanimously to support this development of a pollinator city plan. It's yep. obviously very important to do this, given now that honeybees are no longer present in Newcastle. If they're not, if there are some, they probably won't be there for long. There might be only a few feral hives left. But it's all about increasing native flora in the Newcastle area, creating connections between existing floral areas. 
all things that it would just be good to do anyway, with or mm -hmm. without Varroa being a particular issue. Yeah. But they're the first council in Australia, I think, from what I've picked up on, that's really, um, you know, I suppose they've got extra motivation, don't they? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not for a good reason. And so they want to see more native friendly foliage corridors. Um, so that's good news uh, out that's of what has been an unpleasant situation. Actually, something's just popped into my mind around New South Wales as well. Um, I don't know if you saw, but they've actually finally launched the Purple Hive up in Queensland, ah. which has the photo technology to scan be every individual. That's right. And I've been wondering, have they done any testing? Because New South Wales would be a perfect place right now to put a Purple Hive in and... Um, so I know those guys. Um, they take advantage of that. Yeah, I know those guys, and they did a lot of their testing before we had Varroa right. out of the country, um, which is obviously was critically important to to do yeah. that because you need to get out of this country to do that. We did some work in that space too, and out in other things that I'm involved with. And yes, until now, you've had to take it out of the country to be able to to do that. But um, the more we can do of that sort of thing, no doubt, the better. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity there waiting for them. Exactly, you know, them exactly. Yeah. Um, it begs oh, me to ask, though. Yeah, something I, else. I, I'm not quite done. I've actually just I've excelled this time. I've got a lot, actually, Carmel. Um, what, do you know, <laughs> what do you know about Fiji and beekeeping? Nothing. <laughs> it's, an, it's, was... it's an island of beekeepers. <laughs> Um, I knew I knew bugger all as well, but I'm slowly learning a little bit more each time um, I, I find a little bit more, I, I dig a little bit deeper. And there's another news article here, again, put out by uh, ABC News. Back in March, it was. Its title here is the Fijian beekeepers keen to export their high quality honey, but face pollen shortage. Mm -hmm. And it was that last bit that got me thinking, because um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sort of captured to want to read it more until I saw that the pollen shortage bit and I'll get to that in a second but yeah. it says that they've had a boom in beekeeping over there as well who hasn't had a boom we'll talk about Western Australia later yeah. and just like us they've got a requirement to have pollination um, for many of the crops that they've chosen to grow back in 2018 they they had varroa and varroa is now something they all deal with all beekeepers have to deal with but it talks particularly about um hungry and struggling bees and it's happened and it's not this has not really clicked in my head until i read this um the consistent storms that they've been having the additional wet weather that they've been having think yeah. back to us last year as well yeah. it literally just washes the pollen off the plants off the flowers or washes the flowers away <laughs> destroys the flowers in heavy rain and i don't think and i mean I've, I've said this many times on this show i'm no beekeeping genius here i just learn as i go but i've never really paid a whole lot of attention to that and thought about that but if you've got consistent wet weather obviously bees can't forage easily in wet weather but secondly it's washing off the pollen from the plant yeah. so they lose that nutrition from the plant which anyway i don't know when that's about making more babies so no more no wonder the the hives haven't been growing yeah, that, that's exactly it. So they're, they're really missing a key bit of their nutrition over there. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently over there, they're really big into feed, in feeding their bees raw sugar, um, which, okay, but not really supplementing their food source from that's otherwise pollen. So they're going through a learning experience there with that. That's um, interesting about the raw sugar because I was taught that the raw sugar, because um, it's not like pasteurised or anything, it can give the bees a yucky tummy. Yeah, and and that's exactly what I've understood. Sugar. That's yeah. exactly what I've heard. Um, I've not, I've never used it for that exact reason. Um, but you know, there's a there's a genuine learning exchange going between Fiji and Australia now that's been absent until recent times. So it's good to see that that's happening. Yeah, interesting. Um, and just the last thing, because we should all learn something about Fiji and beekeeping. They're looking at opportunities to have more monofloral type honeys, um, yeah. cough, coffee nectar, and a few other particular plants that they're looking at um, for potential for growth. But I knew nothing about Fiji and their beekeeping industry. So slowly, yeah, we get a little bit wiser about the world, don't we? Charlie's suggesting that maybe their definition of raw is different. 
And I reckon I wondered the same, Charlie. So I reckon that's a really good pickup because um, it could mean any of the derivatives of sugar, I guess, couldn't it? And um, who knows? And yeah. do, they, do they have a, I'm guessing they work with the European honeybee or do they have a bee that's more like the Asian honeybee? Um, so I think, I, no, I can't say I think, I just don't know. But because they're talking about varroa mite, yeah, okay. I've got a hunch that they're talking about European honeybees. It doesn't actually state okay. that here, but yeah. seeing that they're creating a learning link between the two countries, I feel like that's what they're that they're, they're suggesting. It's also European honeybees. Yeah, interesting. Wow, there you um, go. Yep. Yeah. Hey, on the topic of weather, yeah, and this is my last point for now. It's not really news. Oh, it's news. It is news. But I've just tried to digest a little bit, and I don't have a great answer for this query or this thought. Um, but I don't think any of us will quite yet anyway. But you probably saw in the news that El Nino has been suggested is likely to occur or is occurring this this year. So the weather pattern, the El Nino weather pattern. So ultimately, if we've got that issue happening of an El Nino coming, what does that mean? Now, most of us would know what the general, we're, we're, most of us are aware of the general idea of an El Nino now. Southeast Australia is warmer. Um, warmer nights, warmer, hotter days, so hot, higher minimums and maximums, reduced rainfall. Yeah. Uh, wind patterns can change normally, normally more northerly, normally, normally hotter and drier winds. And therefore, that obviously has a reaction on the conditions of the vegetation and the soil moisture and all those things that then go into creating bees need from those plants yeah and this is where Carmel I've got to sort of say I don't know what happens next I'm not that I'm not I did plant biology at university but I can't say I'd, I had the understanding of bees back then and no doubt there's issues in flower set seed production all these different things that come with a change in those climatic conditions yeah have you got any yeah. thoughts on that yeah, look, I do. Um, well, first of all, the El Nino, we we don't actually know, like, because the La Nina, La Nina tends to be two years as a pattern, and unusually you can get three. But yep. the El Nino that we're going into, I believe that it can go on for years, so there's no real pattern as to how long it'll last. Yeah. Um, but having been beekeeping, this is my 13th year beekeeping. And, and um, when I started with uh, the Bunyip Beekeeper, we were in a cold, wet spring. And yep. when we came out of that, honey production, like for, especially for the first couple of years, it was really abundant because there was still moisture in the ground. But I know with gum trees, when it's wet, they do their growing. And it's when it's dry, they do their flowering. But if it yeah. gets too dry, then you don't get the nectar flowing. So I think this next year and the year after are going to be quite bumper. Um, but how long that goes on for, I don't know. And then the ultimate I don't know answer coming from me is it might be fine here where I am, but 10K down the road, there might be some local climatic variable which makes it hard for that location. So Correct. Rem remain flexible, people. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> seems, it seems to be what you need to be good at, doesn't it, um, yeah. when it comes to, to keeping bees? Just yes. be prepared for cha changes and challenges and maybe a warmer start to spring. Well, that'd be nice. Yeah, would actually, just, would actually be really on top of swarming. Would really like a summer, got to be honest. Um, <laughs> a what? A what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Charlie's mentioned um, in the comments about how the, the bushfires that we had through 2019-20 may have had may have been helped what's triggered the the trip the trifecta of La Nina years. And he's just posted an article link there. I'll go and check that out later, Charlie. The other thing that I heard as well, and I'll, I'll try and find that article for you later, is the volcano off Tonga has had an impact on our, well, I think we've talked about it before, haven't we, Carmel? Has had an impact on the Southern Hemisphere weather patterns and is also what contributed. So maybe there's a combination, Charlie, between a cup, uh, between the bushfires and the unbelievable amounts of ash that was put up by the volcano, that the combination of the two is, is the reason why we've had three. Anyway, 
life is interesting. I also heard side thing because I know we're all a bit of environmentalist, sustainability sort of people on this that that have this that come to a place like this, but um, or a session like this. The amount of carbon emitted into the atmosphere from those 2019-20 fires, which we know was staggering, the amount of algae and other um, microbiome that were that were created in the oceans as a or, or what's the right word developed in the oceans as a result of feeding off all that ash have displaced and removed as much carbon dioxide that was created in the fires and has already removed it and absorbed it and recycled it now wow. that's staggering i know it doesn't relate that's not beekeeping but i reckon people on this call like that sort of thing yeah <clears throat> very cool well i have gone on and gone on and i think it's time for me to have a break my turn now <laughs> what's caught your attention carmel um what has caught my attention well um i've noticed that um as i've been um doing my pack downs um we've actually i've heard around the traps we've had some really late flows on and yep. some of those flows have been quite big so that's been encouraging because the last three years, my harvest has been down by about at least half. Mm. Um, but the stringy bark went absolutely off tap. Um, and I know I can see it as I'm driving around, the iron bark is having a good flowering. And then you've got grey box in flower at the moment as well. So um, I know there's a couple of people that probably haven't done pack down yet because they've had a flow on. So ah. this is where knowing your your microclimates are um you know there's there's what's happening generally but then there's what's happening in your own backyard yep. and every time i'm in the car and i'm driving around i'm all, i'm always looking at what's in the street trees so um yeah that's been really pretty interesting huh. um speaking of trees yeah. um i've got this little pamphlet here that uh, the the Victorian, I know some of you are in other parts of Australia and you might have other groups like this, but this is the Victorian Apris Association and they organised um, honey yielding eucalypts of Victoria and other interesting species. And this was, um, the VAA organised it and mm -hmm. it was at the Springvale Botanical Cemetery and we got to walk around with the arborist there called Chris Hewitt. And... Uh -huh. It was it was so fascinating and I took lots of notes and I learned so much and I know I learned about which trees do better pollen, which ones do um, better nectar, what time of year and like it, it was fascinating. Um, but like Chris, he he looks after like five cemeteries and it's him and his assistant and they have to go around to all of them. Um, but he was also talking about um, as some trees only live a certain number of years. And um, so as they take them out, they're then doing forward planning because as a cemetery gets full, um, they don't have income coming in anymore. So they have to yep. forward plan like 100 years or so. Yeah. And they need to put in trees that are lasting a long time. And um, so they're and they're also targeting trees that are climate change ready. So there are some oh, trees yes. that are actually adjusting better to um, climate change better than others. But Chris is also a beekeeper, so having ah. the tree knowledge and the beekeeping knowledge together, it was a, it was a fantastic day. I loved it. So um, if you ever get a chance to go on any excursion, learning about trees, it's it, it, you could do it for a lifetime and not yep. know it all, but it really does help you um, to find out about your flows and recognising what's on and yep. and what the bees are getting from it and that sort of thing. So um, it de definitely goes hand in hand with um, with beekeeping. Yeah, well, yeah. that's um good good job by the VAA for finding something so practical and, and worthwhile. Yeah, well, it was. It was fantastic. I remember I'm um, doing some um, back in the old university days. Um, yeah. Some plant, again, plant biology. Uh, cemeteries are incredibly well known for their variety of endangered and rare plants because they're often protected places. People aren't 
people right. don't go in there and disturb them. Normally they're not driving, a, like they're, they're a protected area. Yeah. You're not about to drive a massive excavator through and, and pull the whole things apart, but it's not uncommon um, for those to be protected areas for the rare plant species that they have. Yeah. You know, you know, you drive down a, in the middle of country Victoria, you can drive down a, a road and there's a set, you see some trees up in the distance in, amongst all of the paddocks. And that's actually a cemetery. It's the only place that has, might have a few trees around it and it's a cemetery. Yeah. yeah. So it's any wonder that that's um, a well-regarded place for, for vegetation and therefore potentially uh, yeah. trees, tree, trees for bees. Yeah, trees for bees. And uh, <laughs> and someone's written, and bees in found in graves. <laughs> Honey to die for. That's funny. Hey. <laughs> they would, yeah, they would find those cavities in there um, quite interesting. Um, yeah, speaking about more trees in flower, um, I, I did want to mention um, almond pollination is coming up soon, and I find this really sure. interesting. Um, obviously, you know, just touching lightly on what's been happening with the varroa in New South Wales, we've got almond pollination, which is um, where New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia, where they all meet each other, that's where the almond fields are. And the lion's share of it is in Victoria. And um, when I, I've sent my hives up twice, and I'm not going to do it again, but, you know, as a smaller beekeeper you can get together with a group of people and and send hives up um but when i first started um you got paid about 110 113 dollars a hive yep um then i believe last year and because the almond industry has been growing um last year it went up to about 130 and then with everything that unfolded, there was not enough bees. And now they're paying 175, which like that to see those jumps in prices per hive, because you've got to you, you don't have your hive for like four weeks. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, but it's still like comparable, I guess. Well, we don't have Varroa here in Victoria, but you know, over in the States, they get like two hundred dollars a hive. So yep. we're 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 coming more into line with that, but they they're they're reaching out to people and to see that price jump i'm like i'm like that's really interesting that they're you know acknowledging that they really need those hives yep yep i am um, a lot i know the price is higher in the states but a lot of beekeepers don't risk it anymore even though that they're desperate to have bees over there and will pay a pretty penny because they know they're just not going to get them back correct yeah well so they just don't bother and the second time I sent my hives, they came back sick, and that's why I won't ever send mine again. Yep. Um, but yeah, they do. They need them. Like so, and it's you know, it's like how much can we pay you to get you to bring your hives up? And yeah, I you know, it's it's balancing act. It is. It is. Yeah. How much are you prepared to? I mean, I guess if you've got a thousand hives or whatever that's a massive chunk of income that you get right at the start of spring. That's your whole year. It, it almost. doesn't year. matter what honey you get. You've, you've started off well. Yeah, exactly. So, and almond pollen, the pollen that comes from almond, they give stuff all nectar, but the pollen that comes from almonds is amazing for the bees. Oh, uh, right on. It's one of the best quality pollens you can get. Yeah. Cause there's, there's virtually zero nectar value, isn't there? Yeah. 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 Virtually zero nectar value. And that's one of I think that's one of the problems they have is you need to make sure your bees are really in a vigorous, productive state on arrival. Yeah. Because they will go backwards with honey. Well, stores. and that's where a lot of beekeepers they go from there straight to the canola fields because that has the huge ah. nectar value. And yep. so then that balances that out and then that's when all the swarming starts. So yep. yeah. So yeah, they follow all those flows around. Yeah, so um, speaking yeah. of which, you know, I've noticed in my own apiary um, and Debbie, who's online here tonight, and she's been writing this, she's still got a flow on in her area. And I know, Debbie, you're still waiting for a day where she can actually do pack down now because it, it, was, it was dripping immensely. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and even at the... Werribee's Bee Club, the other club that I'm involved with, 
Um, we had a late flow there and we, as a club, we've just harvested our last lot of honey, our, yep. first, our first lot of honey from our club apiary. So that was a bit of fun. But what I noticed was there's still a lot of small hive beetle around um, for this time of year. And I don't know whether there's just a pocket now because I know they kind of breed up in areas. So if any of you don't have small hive beetle, you're really lucky to not have them in your area. Um, but yeah, I noticed that they were, there were still quite a few around compared to other years going into winter. Yeah. Yep. yep. Which if that's the case, if they're still there at this time, later than normal, uh, might mean if there's a nice warm start to spring, um, just, just guessing that that might lead to something, um, happening a bit quicker next year for the hive beetles, meaning a bigger build-up. Yeah, not so you've got to really watch that because if they take over the hive, the bees will leave. They'll abscond yep. um, and they'll abandon babies and everything and they'll just turn themselves into a swarm and they'll disappear. Just bail on it, yep. Yeah, keep your hive strong and um, and put some traps in. Yeah, yeah, yep. What else do you do at this time of year? Because obviously the change in weather is pretty significant. Um, what, what else do I do? So once I've got packed down, then I've got to deal with all my stickies and stuff like that. Yep. Um, so I've got lots and lots of frames that I'm melting down, but I've also, I now have a couple of flow hives. And for any of you that do have flow hives, um, and you take those flow frames off in winter time, um, once you've harvested them, what I like to do is I like to leave them in the open position in that flow position. And then I'll put them back on the hive for 24 or 48 hours. And what happens is the bees will clean off all of that wax, but they lick them all out and they clean yep. them all out. So they're not sticky. So they're a lot drier to store away. Um, and you can do that with your normal frames as well. Um, get the bees to kind of clean them all off. But once you've done that, um, if you're going to keep stickies or you've got your flow frames, it's really important then to put them in the freezer for 24 or 48 hours before you put them into the storage box. Because if there's any eggs in there, um, they're going to like for small hive beetle or wax moth. Um, if they're in a dark container that's kind of warm or whatever, um, they can hatch out. So they'll, they'll love it. <laughs> they do love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so now it's it's cleanup time for me and. Um, working with all those stickies and and um, and then me melting down frames. Um, even if you've got a flow hive, you might have a few old frames that you've taken out. So I'm uh, I'm cutting up a lot of foundation at the moment and and melting frames down and and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that keeps yep. me busy. Yeah, 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 that's a big yeah. process. The the whole uh, wax management, isn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, because I've got lots of hives, when I had uh, only a few hives, um, it was much more simpler. Yep. Now that I've got lots of hives, I've actually converted an old oven and I have a, a uh. like a, yeah, and I can do 10 frames at once and that's my first melt um, and then it goes into a stock pot. But when I did it, um, when I was, when I had a smaller amount, um, I would just cut out the frames and then I had like a big, you know, how many litres would that be? Almost 10 litre stock pot. Yep. Yeah, like those half white bucket size. So I'd have a stock pot and I'd probably put a couple of inches of water into the bottom of the pot. Yep. Put all the bits of wax in it and stuff. And then I would bring it to the boil. Once it got to the boil, I'd turn it down. And I actually let it simmer for about 15, 20 minutes, somewhere in there on yep. a gentle simmer. And I find if I do that, the um, the water kind of washes the wax a bit and helps to clean it. Sure. And then the the big white 20 litre honey buckets. Oh, yeah. From Bunnings that are way too heavy for me to carry anymore. They are great for processing wax in. So... I'll get um, an old pillowcase or an old T-shirt that I don't yep. need anymore. Yep. And that that fine um, material is perfect. So um, I'll I'll put it around yep. <clears throat> around the top of the bucket and I'll I'll tie it in. And they've got those kind of ridges, yeah? 
Those so, ridges would sort of hold the, yeah, hold it on nicely, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I make it sort of a little bit down. Yep. Um, and so that slurry, that soup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Soup of, <laughs> the soup of the castings and the wax and the water and all of that, I'll pour that through the bucket. Yep. And then I have found that the slower I let it cool down, the better the wax kind of settles. And so ah, the wax how do you do that? I, I actually have a, I either sit it on carpet or I have a towel underneath the bucket. Yeah. I put the lid on and then I have a towel on the top of the bucket. So I, I ah. kind of try to insulate just, it a bit. Yep. So it just holds its, holds its heat for longer. Holds its heat for longer and it tends slower. to dry. It tends to dry in one clump rather than it dry with a crack through the middle. Interesting. Um, yeah. Ooh, so I've not done um, it like that before. That's good to know. And it'll come out if you once you pull it out. You might find there's a a little bit of propolis on them or brown stuff on the bottom to scrape off, but yep. most of it's really clean through the t-shirt or. Um, pillowcase material um it works really well yeah yep yep natalie's asked if you do anything with that water other than put some chicken stock and some um celery and <laughs> carrot in there yeah yum um <laughs> no that water goes uh, down my drain but all of the castings and the slum gum my worms love it and Ooh, and I, I put it in my compost bin or in my worm farm and um it makes really 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 good compost yeah oh that's a great thought i would not uh, done that either i see deanna's asking a question too about if you can't fit your frames in the freezer do you have a i've got a suggestion but do you have one um i guess the thing to do is leave them um have them in a container that's let's say clear or translucent in color and leave them in the light because wax moths prefer to be in a dark area yep and yep. If, and put them in a cool area where possible what's your suggestion oh simply if you don't have a freezer go on to marketplace or something like that and get a cheap secondhand deep freeze do you know my deep freeze yeah, 120 the... bucks you can get one I, I think i got mine for 40 dollars, and the frames fit in the top of it on perfect. the lip oh perfect that's <laughs> clever so they that hang was, nicely that was not planned <laughs> yeah 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 uh great questions i appreciate hearing it um uh, so i can so what are you going to do with that water yeah could you maybe even flush it down the toilet um could it even go into your garden and the compost i reckon i reckon it wouldn't be a drama it's not toxic Very, there's not anything bad about it no there's nothing bad about it no no nah. Yeah, no, they're they're all good, valid thoughts and ideas. Charlie's with you. He got his for forty bucks too. Oh, how's that? Second hand. <laughs> it doesn't need to be special because it's going to get mucky anyway. And it, and slum gum pushed into egg cartons makes great fire starters. You're absolutely right. It um, that's a good have, one. Yeah, it does have a bit of um bit of wax in it as well. Yep. So because the wax floats to the top, you've got the water, uh, yep. there, but you've got the slum gum. So Oh, yep. and that's the other thing I forgot to mention. Once yeah. I've poured the soup into the um, strainer as such, yep. I, then, I then fill up the kettle. I have a, a full boiled kettle and then I pour another. And that's why the deep bucket works really well. Yes. Yep. that extra space yep. and then you add that extra heat. So I just run another one. So trying to get as much wax out of the slum gum as possible. Yep. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. Oh, well, that, yeah. there's a lot to learn there for people. If they haven't done, if they haven't done what you've suggested just now, and they, that's yeah. a pretty cheap way to get set up and do that simply, that's gonna that's gonna work great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can get a stock pot from Kmart for around twenty bucks, and oh. Oh, if you get one, I suggest you get one with a slightly thicker bottom than a thin bottom, because if you ever forget to put water in your pot um wax without water can become a a, a nightmare a disaster so yep. yeah natalie that looks beautiful natalie's just showing us her um some nice beautiful yellow yep. nice yeah, thick piece there isn't it that's pretty clean yeah that looks lovely no that's will, brilliant you will find that the the wax that comes from the cappings will be a nice light color 
yep. and the wax that comes from those dark frames um because it has the pollen and stuff through it and the brood area will be a, a bright yellow color yeah yep yep fantastic well did you have anything else uh for us with with that topic or how's it all looking for you no i'm pretty good i'm pretty good yep well before i go on and take us down a, a bit more of a pathway i just thought i'd briefly throw out a challenge to the people that are here and i know some of you have done this already on hive buddy and hive buddy is a free place to go by the way so no one needs to think you've got to cough up a dollar to go and do this there's a 10 day beekeepers learning challenge Ooh. and i've just put the link in the notes here and i'll share it with the on on the link when if you're watching this on youtube at a later date i'll make sure the link's down below but this 10 day learning challenge will guide you through a range of different topics over that period of time you don't have to agree agree with everything but you will learn something i absolutely promise you that it's simple it's designed to be 10 to 20 minutes each day if you miss it if you can't be there one day it's all right it'll be there the next um and it takes you through a bit of a journey nice. things things sort of quieten down at this time of year if you've sorted out all your your loose beeswax and all your other bits and pieces so you're wanting to keep your head in the game that's a brilliant way to do it so click that link and uh, go and take a look at that in saying that the other thing that we do on hive buddy is if you have a, if you're a member of a beekeeping club um, like you are Carmel or other bee clubs. A lot of those clubs uh, like to have an online place where they all get together, a place where they can even hold their events or hold their club new, have their club news and other information. We can do that for you on Hive Buddy if you like. And for the poor, poor people out there that happen to be the treasurer or some sort of secretarial function, we can help simplify your collection of um, payments from your mem members as well. So if that happens to be you and you think that there's something in that, make sure you give us a hoy at um, Hive Buddy. We can help you. We'll have a discussion with you about that. But now, Carmel. Yeah. I have some more got? news. I've got more news. More um, news. But, well, it's some news that then leads into a research paper. Okay. Um, well, you're putting your nerdy hat on. Oh, when's it not on? <laughs> when you're sitting just hat on. It's just that sometimes, yes, it's just that sometimes the silly hat dominates. Um, so this is, I did allude to this one earlier. Uh, bee industry blooms to nearly 5,000 beekeepers across Western Australia. That's the title in the Countryman, that, um, whatever the publication that might be. Blooms, and I know, see what they did there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're saying that in the last five to 10 years, it's gone from 800 beehive, uh, beekeepers to nearly 5,000. Um, that's a pretty staggering increase, but we know that that's been the same in all other states. And we know it's also been the same. We've done a fair bit of research um, in hive keepers about where the beekeepers are, and that's the same in other other uh, nations similar to us. Huge increase in number of beekeepers. Yeah. Now this comes back to a conversation we had at our last bee club meeting, where we presented some research that was talking about how where are we, where are we? Is there too many managed beehives impacting on the local native bee populations or native pollinators? And it was, are we sort of like pushing too hard as small scale beekeepers? We sit here feeling like we're doing something good, something contributing to sustainability, to help food, food security, to help our local environment by having a beehive. But are we in fact doing that or are we perhaps doing the opposite and creating a bit of a burden. Mm. Um, so that came up with a study out of Montreal last time. Mm. The fact that now Western Australia are telling us about how many, with the large increase in their beekeepers, this issue keeps on coming up. Well, it keeps on coming up for me. In reading that, then came I came across another research paper, um, which was published last year in this, uh, in this publication called Ecological Applications. Sure, it's a riveting read, but um, <laughs> not joking. I am joking. But it says here, the title, and then I'll try and digest it a little bit for you. Low resource availability drives feeding partitioning between wild bees and honeybees in European cities. So again, this is specific to Europe, not so much Australia, but I like the fact that it just makes us ponder and think. Now, I'll probably have a whole heap of people want to jump off this call in a minute because it feels like it gets a little bit technical, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. 
So a few things are highlighted here. It says urban ecosystems can host richer wild bee communities than highly intensified agricultural areas. Okay, yeah. so that makes sense in an urban environment where they well, I'll keep reading because it says it really nicely here. There's resource rich urban green spaces such as family gardens, weedy allotments, parklands. There's plenty of lots of diversity. At the same time, urban beekeeping has boomed in many European cities, raising concerns that the fast addition of a large number of managed beehives could deplete the existing floral resources triggering competition between wild bees and honeybees. So you can see where this is heading. Are we actually creating this problem between European honeybees and native pollinators? So it goes on here and it shows, you could go through the whole study and I'll post this later to make sure that others can have a look. And by the way, when I say I'm gonna post this later, I'm gonna be sharing it within the Hive Buddy Bee Club group, you need to go and sign up to be a free member of Hive Buddy to be able to access all that stuff. Um, I'll make sure there's a link there later. A lot of you already are. Just go and join the Bee Club. Um, it says, we found an increase in feeding partitioning with increased wild bee species richness. So the more species that there are, the more partitioning and little pockets um, that they go to. So they obviously have to specialize in one particular area. It did then say, however, that beekeeping intensity at the local and landscaping scales, so I think local is in like my local area where my bees are, but then landscape being city-wide or landscape-wide, beekeeping intensity at the local and landscape scales did not directly influence community feeding partitioning or wild bee species richness. So it seemed to indicate that that's, it's not such a big deal. It might logically think like it is, but it wasn't saying it was in this study. Wild bee species richness was positively influenced by local resource availability, whereas local honeybee abundance was positively affected by landscape resource availability. And how I look at that is what, um, native pollinators uh, have a smaller range and are looking at what's available to them locally, whereas honeybees with a much larger foraging range looking across the landscape for their food. And then it says, overall, these results suggest that direct competition for resources was not a main driver of the wild bee community. So I was encouraged in hearing this, that perhaps the competition isn't as severe as what I first thought. Um, so overall, this is just another study it, contra it doesn't contradict, but it's just giving a different example from the Montreal study from last time, which was saying that there were issues with it. What it does here, I don't think we really know. Do we know what happens in Melbourne? Do we know what's going on in, in a regional town in South Australia? I don't think we do because we haven't had the study effort to be put into I there think, yet. I, I, personally, I think the biggest threat is that if we get rid of our native habitat and because it was the native habitat that was here in the first place. And so I think the more we can, obviously honeybees are adaptive and they love, they love our Australian, they're naturalised now. They've been there that long. Sure. Um, but, you know, things like the, the um, tetragonula that pollinate the macadamia flowers, they were brought yep. up together. And the honeybees can't fit in the macadamia flowers either. They're too big and clunky. Yeah. for those tiny little flowers. So there's, you know, I think, yeah, if we can focus on. Well, do you know what I think is going to be a really interesting experiment? And I hope someone makes this uh, some scientific research is the we talked earlier about what's happening in Newcastle with their um, ribbons of green and pollinate, yeah. pollinator friendly plants. That should surely be a good place to do a study in learning and understanding what happens with the local pollinators now that European honeybees are more or less absent from that ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a wouldn't that be waiting? I mean, it's just they're begging, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be great to know. And maybe this work was done. I don't know what it was like prior to Varroa arriving there, and therefore what it would be like, say, in another twelve or twenty-four months from now, after the absence of honeybees, what happens? There's mm. people out there smarter than us that I'm sure have got their heads around that. And I hope that they're putting some time and effort into that. 
Anyway, yeah. I, to me, the jury's still out a bit, Carl. Yeah, not, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I'm not convinced either way completely yet. I, I have experienced firsthand, though, on the property that I live on, because um, I'm on an acre and a half, so I think officially I can have 30 hives here or something. But I know there are there are moments with, throughout the season where I can't have more than 10 hives here. Ah, uh, right. Because there's just not enough food to share around. So even in a suburban area, if you've got lots of um, hobby beekeepers around, um, and, and of course, you know, sometimes like grey box, for example, you'll have a really abundant year and a not so abundant year. The silky yep. grevillea flowers amazingly one year and then the next year it only flowers a little bit. Yep. So you've got ebbs and flows in the available nectar. and and if you've got, I think if if the, it's too loaded in an area, even the honeybees are going to compete with each other. And that's Correct. where you get robbing and stuff. So it'll be interesting to see what our future brings, whether at some point, if it becomes much more regulated, whether they do the the councils working with the yep. governing, the, you know, DPIs and stuff, whether they do cap, put some caps and limits onto, I don't know. I mean. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, and whether or not we ourselves should apply some limits on our own effort. Like, that's why I bring these things up is it's all right to have limits. Well, maybe it's not all right to have limits imposed, forced upon us. That's a conversation for another day. But <laughs> by choice, <laughs> but by choice, should should that be what I'm doing is just, you know, I've had times where my little backyard here has had way too many beehives in it and it's just yeah. practically awkward. COVID made that hard. I think all of us had to shuffle things around during that time and do things that we wouldn't normally do. Yeah. But is that the is it the right thing to do to have loads of them? Is it the right thing to do to go from one to two to six to twelve and it never stops? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's about balance. It's about balance. Hey, I've got one more thing to um shake up the night. Can I give you one more? One more, go for it. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, um, timing. Perfect. And I hope you realise what I just did. But um, the title, well, the, the title of this section is Do Earthquakes Kill Bees? So I wanted to, um, ex after nearly falling out of bed last night, well, I pretty much, did you get what I did? Have you worked it out yet? I wanted to show yeah, yeah, you. Gotta, it isn't it, yeah. isn't it bad news? It's bad news when the person has to feel like they've got to explain the joke. So I, I apologise, everyone. Shouldn't have done that. Um, so... I was really curious after last night, like what impact is there on uh, bees having an earthquake? So I found a great article titled Do Earthquakes Kill Bees? And this is by Prudence Wood from the Bee Professor website, beeprofessor.com. Um, this was published about a year ago. And there's some really good points here. And again, the jury's not out on this, by the way. There's just not enough research. Earthquakes are too infrequent and you never know where they're necessarily going to be to be able to really like prepare appropriate research for this. But anecdotally, it stacks up that maybe there is an impact. And I'll go and tell you a few things of what scientists believe. And remember, believe doesn't necessarily mean it's proven fact at this stage. There's certainly um, earthquakes can kill bees. There's been experiences where almost immediately after earthquakes, bees have been found dead. Um, you could imagine the if damage is caused to the hive, it's fallen off a thing, it's something's collapsed on it. I mean, that's the obvious way that you could expect some damage. Um, that's that's part of it. But there's certainly been damage to bees that are you know, damage to hives or the bees inside those hives that are not easily explained. So whilst there's not a lot of specific research, that anecdotal sort of um, information out there suggests that earthquakes can disrupt the magnetic field. And we know how sensitive anim most animals are to adjustments in the magnetic field of the earth. Mm -hmm. And therefore with bees, it can be catastrophic because their navigation resulting in disorientation, um, not finding their way home, being becoming lost, getting cold, starving, dying. Um, so that's been a, been a thought. That's absolutely something that can occur. Um, but I encourage you all, and I know that wasn't like a super earthquake or anything, but I don't know, but maybe just check and see if there's anything happening different with your bees. And if there is some unexplained death, I mean, at this time of year, I'd think, well, maybe they've just starved. 
but what if they're, what if it's not? So if you notice anything, I urge you to get in touch with us and let us know what, you, what you've come across. And my hunch is that maybe not a whole lot will have happened, but then again, we don't know unless we I hear about it. I love how you get us thinking along different lines. It's like, oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you, be, you try and be inside this head. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Drive you crazy. <clears throat> no, it you don't want to be. Interesting. There was, um, I w I'm going to have to look into it as, as a separate time and maybe report back, but in this particular article, one study that they say was worth, worth mentioning happened in northern Taiwan. That's a, they have plenty of earthquakes. Um, they recorded large declines of insects living near water as the result of a 6.8 and a 7.3 magnitude earthquake. So Drown in the I'll, water or something? I don't know. I'll go down that rabbit hole and one day see if I can... Um, report back but um, generally people are talk about the magnetic field impacting on the bees anyway i thought that was very topical had to be brought up but the finishing point on this for me and it's well put by this um journalist or this person earthquakes probably do play a role in bee populations but keep in mind that tectonic plates have been shifting forever <laughs> mm. and there are still bees prospering and doing just fine and it's probably more our own impacts on them that stuff them up yeah and in than anything that the earth can throw at them absolutely yes <laughs> debbie's debbie's applauding you <laughs> yes that's the way i think of it anyway and that yeah. probably brings uh, us to be honest carmel to the end of our evening just about did you have any finishing comments or parting parting words to the people listening in well, I do have a question for all Ooh. of you in that we do already have our date for the next month and we do run these once a month. So has anyone got any topics or anything you would like us to, uh, you know, investigate or go into a bit further for you? Or And do you know what I'll do with that, Carmel? Because that's an yeah. excellent point. I'll let people, can, people will no doubt make comments here in the meeting chat. Yeah. Um, but I'll actually ask the exact same question within the Hive Buddy online community, so inside the Hive Buddy um, platform. And that way people can also go away and ponder and think about it. So we might try and make that a regular thing to do after each of these meetings to put something up to see so that people can digest and would it, and um, come back with what matters to them right now. Charlie's mentioned um, winter projects and I would think that that makes sense. Um, I'm even keen to one day talk more about the whole, uh, like what we can do with some of the products of bees with cooking, but hence, hence that note that I want you to have written down for us to talk about one day, cooking with propolis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep, get the ideas through to us because we do like it. Now, in saying that, we did say that the next one was Tuesday, the 27th of June. I've put the link already off to the side here. You can go and register now. I can see some of you already have, so thanks for that. I'll put the link there one more time um, now. But Carmel, I think we've done all right. We'll hang around a little bit for those that um, do want to hang back, but we might um, finish it up there. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Linesman. Thank you, Ball Boys. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's always lovely to get together and have a chat. Absolutely. Thanks indeed. Take care. Nice.